Hi guys, it's Vanessa. I'm here to wrap up some more things that I've read for nonfiction November. I think it's winding down now and there's only like three days left in November. The first thing that I read since the last time I updated was Rx, a graphic memoir by Rachel Lindsay. I really, really enjoyed this graphic memoir. It focuses on Rachel Lindsay's life, being diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but having to maintain a job where she's basically selling pills to other people who are dealing with mental illnesses and kind of like that sticky middle ground where she is selling things in sometimes sketchy, skeevy ways and then at the same time dealing with her own bipolar disorder. I think the best part about this book is how humorous and funny it is in the style of her drawings. She is just loud and it's like really fast paced and I think that really gets at kind of the emotions she was feeling being told what to do by her parents who have her best interests in mind but who are still telling an adult what to do. It's just to me showing that kind of incredulity she feels that her parents and other people in her life are trying to tell her what to do. So I really enjoyed it and I would definitely recommend it if you're into graphic memoirs and especially any graphic memoir dealing with mental illness. The next thing that I finished after that is Under the Banner of Heaven by John Krakauer. This is my third John Krakauer book. I've always said that I've enjoyed his books but I have to say I was really disappointed by this one. I listened to it on audiobook. Maybe that wasn't the right way to do it, but I just felt like the main story was not as compelling to keep me engrossed. We're following these fundamentalist Mormons headed by Dan and Ron Lafferty, these brothers who have this idea of how Mormonism is supposed to go back to this way that it was practiced centuries ago, juxtaposing that with how Mormonism got started and the history of it. I found some of those passages really insightful and interesting and I thought understanding who Joseph Smith was, where he came from, and what people contemporary people thought about him was really interesting. I also really enjoyed hearing about Brigham Young and other people and kind of the factions that happened because of the way that Mormonism is set up. It's basically like anybody can be talked to by God and therefore those people might decide that God told them that they're the ones that are supposed to continue leading this religion and that's how so many different factions have been forming including these fundamentalist sects that have occurred. This I think was insightful to read after reading Educated by Tara Westover this year um, because her her family was raised in that kind of fundamentalist Mormon environment. So it's kind of interesting to see the connections there. Though I just didn't think that John Krakauer had as good a story here, following these brothers who are committing this heinous crime for basically no reason, just their religion and their god told them to do it. I would pass on it, but I do know that lots of people enjoy this book, so maybe it just wasn't for me, and maybe it's the fact that it's a little bit older nonfiction. I published in the early 2000s, and I think nonfiction has really changed since then. I still think Into Thin Air is my favorite John Krakauer book. The next thing that I read that I was so happy to read was Becoming by Michelle Obama. I listened to this one on audiobook. I didn't know that the audiobook was 19 hours long long. Somehow I listened to it in three days because that's how into it I was. My favorite parts about this memoir is hearing Michelle Obama tell her story about her childhood and growing up with her family. That was my absolute favorite part. Basically I think the best moments here are pre-2008. Maybe even the election and the campaign is interesting in 2008. Definitely it's her childhood growing up in the south side of Chicago and deciding to go to Princeton and her discussing her family's bonds and where she lived with her mom and her dad and her brother. Um, just hearing those stories about her family that I didn't know about. Hearing about her dad's medical issues. I did not know her dad suffered through multiple sclerosis. Um, definitely cried hearing her talk about Barack and her daughters and what it took to get that family unit she really wanted and then kind of like realizing that her husband was just meant for this office and kind of just letting it be really after being against it for so long. That last maybe third, you know, half to third is her talking about all the things that she enjoyed about being first lady and all the things that she found really memorable. I think those might get a little bit more repetitive because she kind of just goes through the whole eight years in chronological order, but I do think those sections are interesting to hear about kind of like the secret service and how they protect the family. Also really interesting to hear kind of just like the day-to-day -day goings on of how things are done in the White House. I really Really, really enjoyed Becoming. I definitely recommend it on audiobook and I think it deserves all the all the praise it's been getting and all of the hype it's been getting. Everybody I think should read this book to just learn a little bit more about Michelle Obama. If you don't know her whole life story I think it's definitely worth it. Alright after that was my 
day, which was today, that I finished up a bunch of things. One of those is Palaces for the People by Eric Kleinenberg. I read this one on audiobook primarily. In this book, we are looking at how social infrastructure can help fight inequality, polarization, and the decline of civic life. Basically, what Eric Kleinenberg is arguing here is that we need more social infrastructure in our society and he means libraries, he means parks and recreation centers, he means schools, he means community gardens, um, all of these places where interactions between community members happen. He's basically arguing that we need to put more money into this. When we fix all of those things and when we make that infrastructure better where these interactions can happen, the community ties really help so much. It makes people healthier, it makes the economy grow, and it makes just everything feel less divisive feel more like you're connecting with your neighbors. He bases this on field work that he does, going to these communities in New York primarily, but also research that he's done in Chicago in years past. And I really liked his ideas here. I agree with the social infrastructure philosophy and, and thoughts of how we should lead our future society. After I read the first chapter, I was like super adamant this is going to be a really high starred book. The first chapter focuses exclusively on libraries, and I really liked how he discussed libraries and their values to our society. But then after that, he sort of tries to separate into different social infrastructure um, sections that he wants to talk about per chapter, and I just think that it wasn't as successful as it was in the first chapter. Over time, they kind of just became mixed and jumbled, which is totally okay because you know that these infrastructures are intertwining and people who go to one go to the other and regardless, you know, they're experiencing all of these infrastructures at the same time. But I think that if he had focused it on one singular infrastructure per chapter, I think I would have gotten his message more because that first chapter was so effective and I felt like the other ones weren't as much. We'd be talking about community gardens and then he'd be interviewing Jelani Cobb about his mother taking him to the library and why the library meant so much to him growing up. And it kind of just felt a little bit um, unfocused in those parts and I wish it was just a little bit more organized there. The next thing that I finished was Paperback Crush by Gabrielle Moss. This is a really, really fun book inside. I really enjoyed the physical look of it. I love the glossy pages. I love that we were able to see all of these paperback covers and I also really enjoyed the way that this was separated by chapters based on different themes that were featured and discussed in these books in the 80s and 90s including things like family and romance and friendship and starting clubs things like taboo topics as well as horror and how horror thrived during these years. I think this is something that you want to pick up when you're looking for something light and entertaining. It's not something that you're going to pick up to really get a deep dive into the history of these titles and what these things meant to the 80s and 90s. I do think that she does provide commentary, kind of like the Reagan era and the Clinton era and what was going on and how that impacted what was being written about. But I also just think that teen fiction has evolved so much that I don't even know if you can provide as much commentary. It just seems like, like fun things to read at the time and not necessarily something that is showing us something about the time and place. So yeah, I thought it was fun. I learned a lot because I didn't grow up reading these books. But it was fun when she also compared it to the teen fiction that I grew up reading of the 2000s and 2000... 2010s? Maybe early 2010s. And also the little interviews that she does in every chapter. She has like little interviews with actors on the covers or people in the publishing industry then or really famous authors from that time period. And I really like those little vignettes as well. All right, last but not least, I just finished Escape from Syria, which is a graphic novel based on real reporting but using a fictionalized main character and main family. But it is based on reporting that this journalist has done in Lebanon about Syrian refugees in camps there. And also other information that we've gathered from the Syrian refugee crisis over the years since the war started. What I really enjoyed about this book is that it's very short, but it is very effective. It loses no time and it wastes no pages in giving you really valuable information, teaching you lots of things that you don't really know about and having to do with this crisis. I didn't really know about what it was like for them to go to places like Turkey or Lebanon. And this one we focus on Lebanon. You kind of just think of them leaving from Syria to 
other resettlement areas like Canada or in Europe or in the United States and I didn't know what that life was like before they left to their new country or, or place. So that was really fascinating to learn about here and also it was really fascinating at the same time really sad to hear about the things that the family would have to do to make sure that they survive, that they were able to get her brother medicine, the problems that come from doing all of those things. You're, you know, in debt to the pharmacist, you are in debt to these loan shark people who are trying to get you out of Lebanon on boats with fake life vests and all of these things and then seeing the main character and her family be seen by a UN worker and then be chosen to move to Canada and to be part of the resettlement in Canada. So it's not like they apply for it, they were chosen. I think this is great if you don't know much or if you know a lot about this crisis because there's little nuggets that you learn about that you didn't know about anyway and it's also a good way to encapsulate the problem and the situation in 90-ish pages with pictures. It just did a lot in a little amount of pages and sometimes that is not easy to do. I also really really love the art. I will say I cried two times reading this. Some pages were just so emotionally impactful for me um, and just made me think a lot. I give a lot of props to the artists for that because they really showed me this father-daughter relationship in a way that I, I really valued and I really cared for them. And so I would definitely recommend this book if you're into graphic novels at all or if you're looking to learn more about the Syrian refugee crisis. I was very surprised by this one and I kind of just pulled it off the shelf and it ended up being really great. Lastly, I kind of want to go through things that I am either about to read, um, have given up on, or, you know, kind of update you on my TBR. I put on my original TBR, Dope Sick, by Beth Macy. I DNF that book. I read about two hours of it on the audiobook. I thought it was too dry for me and I thought that it was focusing too much on the corporation's front of the opioid crisis too much for me to enjoy it, so I DNF'd it. Another one that I've, I think I'm gonna DNF, I have already on Goodreads, but I might come back to it at some point, is Bonk. I ended up reading 70 pages or so on the print form. There's no e-audio available. I even tried to borrow the CD version of it from my library to see if I could listen to the audiobook. I wasn't able to find a way to speed up the audiobook on the CD version and I was getting annoyed listening on one time speed. So I just decided it's okay. I'll read something else by Mary Roach and then maybe at some point when I feel like reading print text, I'll come back to this book. So Goodbye Blanc. I started on audiobook, but I don't know if it's going to catch on or if I'm going to listen to it all the way through. Heavy by Keith Lehman. This is a memoir from this man growing up in the South, how he felt in his body as a fat black person in the South. It's very lyrical so far and very poetic, and therefore I think the audiobook is the way to do it. So maybe I'll catch on the audiobook. I'll let you know what I end up deciding about this one. Other books that I have out... Okay, guys, I found an e-audiobook version of The Cadaver King and the Country Dentist, which I was really excited about because I've, I've been struggling to actually physically read this book and I think that's been 2018 personified. <laughs> um, I just can't read print books anymore and I need the momentum of an audiobook to get me through a book. So I'm waiting on hold for this. <laughs> I was number four and now I'm number two of two copies so hopefully it comes in soon. I won't be able to finish this before Nonfiction November is over but I'll keep you updated because I actually do think that the story is fascinating and right up my alley. I just need the audiobook to really enjoy it. Other things that I have out from the library that I don't know if I'm gonna read, but I don't know what's going on. <laughs> One of them is White Fragility, and it's Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism by Robin D'Angelo. I've heard lots of good things about this. I'm gonna try to see if there's an audiobook version of it. It's very short, but I do like that inside there's um, bullet points and other things. It's kind of like an instructive text in a way too, which I think will be interesting to read. And I heard of her from Call Your Girlfriend. She was interviewed on the podcast Call Your Girlfriend and I liked what she had to say. So this is another one that's on the maybe and going to happen in the future. I think that's it. I have a few more things out, but most of them are graphic novels and have nothing to do with nonfiction November <laughs> or their middle grade books that also have nothing to do with nonfiction November. So I'm going to leave it at that and I'll come back later. I'm hoping that December is going to be a more relaxed reading month. What I usually do in December, just picking up what I feel like picking up to round up and finish up the year. Thank you so much for watching my video. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that your nonfiction November has been going swell, swell, well. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in my next video. Bye-bye.